Back to Genesis, and if you haven't been with us or just been with us for part of it, we as a church do believe that Genesis it contains history. It, it's not mythical. Uh, we do believe in a six literal day creation. We believe everything you see, taste, touch, smell was brought into existence from nothing by the spoken word of God. And we, we, we stand on that truth. And I think that has to be a foundational truth to even get to the gospel. And so we've got to believe that in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. So again, as a church, we do believe in, in six literal days of creation and on the seventh, God rested. Now, when God created man, He created man special. He breathed a living soul into man. Animals do not have a living soul. Animals came from God. They go to the ground. But men and women were created with a soul that enabled us to, to communicate with God, to relate with God. That God made us not as lemmings, but as beings who were able to make decisions. All right? How often do we make good ones? Uh, not as often as we should. Sadly, that is the fate of fallen man. Uh, once sin entered the world, we all became sinners from one man, Adam. And now, again, our decisions take us from God. And God knew that. It wasn't a surprise. It, it wasn't plan B. He knew there would be a fall, and so He's always had a plan for redemption through Jesus Christ. And He began working towards redemption, or working through men towards redemption. And that man, first man we talked about, really, was Abram. Abram, we, we discussed him, that God spoke to him and moved him. He packed up, took his family, and we're following his life. He's called the pioneer of faith. And we can learn so much from Abram. Now, he'll be Abraham tonight, so we can stop that foolishness and talk about it the way we do. Uh, knowing what we know of Abram so far, what kind of opinion do you think he would have of American Christianity? Stop and think about that. Look at the broad perspective. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here during the midweek, and a pretty good sized choir at that. But the average churchgoer in our country attends one service a month. That's the new statistics. It used to be two. But the most recent survey showed the average church attender, Christian church attender, attends one service a month. And that one had better be good. Right? That one had better be excellent. Your kids' programs had better knock it out of the park. The worship team had better be tight. And the message had better be brilliant and brief. Otherwise, next month on my one day, I'm going to take whatever it is I put in the offering plate and put it somewhere else. Right? That's American Christianity, unfortunately, on the average. And so when Charles Swindoll gave the uh, statement, and uh, put it on your handout, what Abraham would think, Abraham would not understand our shallow relationship with God. And I think that's a good definition of American Christianity. A shallow relationship with God. I've always wondered, I never thought about Abraham, but I've always wondered about what if people in biblical times came and walked into an American church today. I think about what if Paul or Peter came to a church and visited, what one word would they come up with? And I think inconsistent would be a good word they would probably see. Because when they called church services, everybody showed up. And if you didn't show up, you better have an excuse. Somebody was going to come and get you. And they just didn't have them once a week. They met every day. They got together as, as families and they ate together and they prayed together and they sang hymns together and they studied the text together. And so looking at our practice, I think Peter and Paul would clearly say we're inconsistent as, as a church. Then I thought about David. What if David attended a church service? I, I love studying David, not just because he's my namesake or I'm his. Uh, but I think David would have one word description, boring. Right? Boring. Because what did David do when he worshipped? He danced. David danced, clashed loud cymbals, made a lot of noise, made a lot of celebration. He made a lot of big deal about God. He, he believed in a big God. And, and when he worshipped, it was a celebration. It was exciting. And I think he would think American Christianity is boring. All right, so it's not hard to believe what Abraham would think in light of the path that we're seeing him on. And we see him on again today. I think Abraham's one word would be shallow. Would be shallow. So let that not be said of us as we look into the text this evening and learn how to grow deeper in our long haul walk with God. 
So why don't you turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 17. I won't make you stand on Wednesday nights. I know it's been a long day. Uh, chapter 17, the book of Genesis. I'll read the entire chapter. It's, it's a good 27 verses long, but I brought a cup of water with me, so we're good. Uh, we're, we got some lubrication up here. Hmm. And I had Jim Lee singing, and I had Greg going to pray, and so it's nice to have help. It's really nice to have help. All right, we begin in Genesis chapter 17, uh, verse 1. This is the word of God to us. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. And he's 99. At this, Abram fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, thank you. Your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. From generation to generation, every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. This applies not only to members of your family, but also to the servants born in your household and the foreign-born servants for whom you have purchased. All must be circumcised. Your bodies must bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. Any male who fails to be circumcised will be cut off from the covenant family for breaking the covenant. Then God said to Abraham, Regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. The name Abraham bowed down to the ground, he, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? So Abraham said to God, May Ishmael live under your special blessing. But God replied, No. Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. As for Ishmael, I will bless him also, just as you have asked. I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants. He will become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac, who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. When God had finished speaking, he left Abraham. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael, and every male of his household, including those born there and those he had bought, then he circumcised them, cutting off the foreskins just as God had told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised. And Ishmael, his son, was 13. Both Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised on that same day, along with all the other men and boys of the household, whether they were born there or bought as servants, all were circumcised with them. Father, thank you for your word. It's truth. Guide us in your truth. Reveal your truth to us this evening so we can leave this place to be changed, more like our Savior. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's just go ahead and take the shock value out of the lesson tonight. It sounds like this is an entire chapter of the Bible on the physical act of circumcision. And yes, adult men had to be convinced to allow Abraham to circumcise them, and we're going to talk about that. 
And yes, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised. And from there on out, all Jewish men were and still are circumcised today, on the eighth day. Is that all there is in this chapter? I mean, really, did we just come here to discuss how circumcision started and go home? No, it wouldn't do us a lot of good. And really, the chapter is not about circumcision. It's just a part of what took place. Now, what can we learn? What can we draw? There's two big ideas. And the first one on your hand out there, let me get ready. Turn this on. All right, I missed that part. All right, the first thing we're going to talk about is waiting on God. This is a very important topic to speak of this evening, and we're going to spend a lot of time on it. We live in an instant gratification culture, don't we? Instant gratification. Whether I need it or want it, I have to have it now. And that felt need out of that desire has driven technology, right? That's what drives technology. Technology doesn't drive desire. Desire drives technology. And that's driven our technology to produce that. I can get on Amazon and I ordered a book Saturday or Sunday morning and I got it Monday at my house. Right? It came in the mail that way the next day. That's impressive. We're so used to this instant gratification that we really struggle with one word, right? We hate to wait. We really hate to wait. And unfortunately, that same problem exists in our relationship with God. We hate to wait. Now, we're going to talk about something called the quiet years. And this is where your quiz comes in. You thought I was kidding. You had last week off, so it's been two weeks since Andrew taught from the last chapter of this book. Okay? What happened in the last chapter of this book? Anybody? Quick summary. Who was born? Ishmael. Okay? Ishmael was born in this last chapter out of Abraham's or Abram's impatience. He refused to wait on God and he brought trouble that still exists in the world today because of the birth of Ishmael. Now, here's the catch. How long has it been between the end of the last chapter and the beginning of this chapter? Did anybody do the math? Say it louder. 13 years. 13 years. I heard Kathy back there. Here talking. It's been 13 years between these two chapters of the Bible. What happened? I mean, did he just have a boring existence for 13 years? Obviously, the Bible's not big enough to record the entire life and every day of Abraham or Abram's life. But nothing notable happened for 13 years, okay? For 13 years, nothing notable happened. Nothing. Nothing that was recorded. Sometimes we miss things in the Bible. Obviously, it's a, it's a big book, but it's not the biggest book. But when you stop and think about it, for 13 years, we don't have any recorded adventures. No lopsided military battles. No famines. Nothing. Nothing exciting happened except he went on being a husband, a father, now, a herdsman, a businessman, and for 13 years, that's what he did. I, I think we have trouble with that in our instant gratification life. We seem to think that if God's not speaking loudly or moving in a mighty way, that he's not there. And sometimes I think we can get lost when God is silent. We can get lost when God is silent. To me, I think the quiet times are the valuable times. Right? Because when God is loud, sometimes it's because something's bad about to happen. How do we prepare for it? We do that in the quiet times. When life is running routinely and life is quiet, we can actually build our spiritual disciplines into our routine, can't we? When we're in the mundane periods of our life, which they do happen for years sometimes, we get to go into the same place at the same time, doing the same work. Right? We can get up and if I want to set my clock, build 10 minutes extra into the morning for some time of prayer. The time to do that is when it's mundane. If I want to actually make that a half an hour, right? Then I adjust my schedule so I can do some Bible reading. When life is mundane, that's the time to do it. That's the time we're working. That's the time we're, we're digging in deep with our relationship with God. Unfortunately, too many Christians do just the opposite. When life is going along and automatic, they don't need God. They feel like they're handling everything the way it is, right? Nothing exciting is happening. I'm not being tested. I'm not being challenged. 
I'm just kind of working on my own right now. And unfortunately, when God does get down, they're not ready. And they're the ones who struggle the most. They feel like they don't need church. They feel like they don't need to spend quality time with other believers. They feel like they don't need to read their Bibles and pray. Everything is just good until it isn't. And sadly, that's a shallow Christian walk. And it ends tragically in a lot of cases. When you stop and think about it, Abraham had to be disciplined enough to remain close enough to God to hear from him after 13 years of silence, right? If Abraham had just slipped away into mundane, maybe he'd have never heard God speak. But he did. And that speaks volumes. Consider some of the other characters in the Bible that I thought of. If you do the math, you'll learn that the events given in the New Testament regarding the life of the Apostle Paul only cover one-third of the years he lived after salvation. What did he do the other two-thirds of the time? He made tents. He went to work and, and did the mundane, just like you and I do most days. He went to work, but when God called him, he was ready. He obviously stayed disciplined. How about Jesus? How long did Jesus walk the earth? 33 years? 32, 33 years. Some people will argue about the dates, but I won't split years. What do we know about the first 30 years of Jesus' life? We know that at 12 years old, he got left at the temple by his parents for a couple of days. That's it. And we know about his birth. The rest of his life must have been mundane. Whether he was a stonemason or a wood carpenter, we're, again, you can talk about that, but here's once more. But he went through 30 years of an average, unnotable life. Right? And then all of a sudden he was whisked into his ministry. We learn a lot from the first few verses of this, this chapter. We have to be careful not to lose touch with God during the mundane periods of our life. Matter of fact, we need to use those periods to develop depth if we're going to be in it for the long haul. Okay? Now, let's look at the next thing. Back in action. He's had 13 years. And how old is he now? He's 99 years old. Surely, Abraham had to start thinking this is twilight time. I mean, the lifespan of human beings had already dropped. We covered that in the previous studies. It had already fallen now, and he's 99, Ishmael's 13, and wow, he had to think, I'm just going to cruise right on off into whatever God has for me for eternity. I'm done. He had to be thinking that, and then the Lord appears to him at 99 years old. So 13 mundane years of planting seeds and 13 mundane years of Raising cows and sheep and goats and donkeys. And he's almost 100 years old. And now God is moving him again. He shakes the cobwebs out. Let's look at some things he actually does. One thing God does to him is he tells him, remember the basics. Remember the basics. It's baseball season. We just had the All-Star game. So I was thinking in baseball analogies and illustrations. So I don't apologize. Uh, you know, I just think that way. Um, Abraham's been on the bench for a long time. He's on the team, but he's got his shirt untucked. He's drawing funny faces on baseballs. He's chewing sunflower seeds and spitting out the shells. And now the coach yells him and tells him to get back in the game. And the first thing the coach does is remind him of the basics. There's the basics. There's the basics of being a follower, right? You. Abram, you, put your own name in there. That's why I put it in parentheses. Walk before me faithfully and blamelessly. Faithfully and blamelessly. Those are the basics. I think sometimes we wonder, as Christians, why God doesn't use us in a big way. Sometimes we may get frustrated because it seems like we're not getting anywhere spiritually. This is the time to look at, are we living by the basics? Can God use somebody in a big way if they're not living by the basics? No. Abraham, for those 13 years, had to be living by the basics. And God reminds him, this, sir, these are the basics of following me. Be faithful, be blameless. 
We've got to remember that ourselves. We need to be faithful. Faithful to prayer. Faithful to study. Faithful to the fellowship of believers. We need to be faithful and we need to be blameless. We need to care about what everybody else thinks of us. I hate to hear that. I don't care what anybody else thinks of me. That's not Christian. We need to care. We need to be blameless. And apparently, Abram was. And that's how he got called off the bench. The second thing we, we see is remember the promises. Abram, remember the promises, right? Abram was promised blessing. He was promised seed. He was promised land. He's promised three big things. And now God brings it back up. And he says very clearly, after last study, right, when he was 83 or 86, and he had Ishmael, and now 13 years later, God says, whoa, 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 I will, not I have. I will greatly increase your numbers. Abram had a promise. And after 13 years, I would guess he probably was starting to question that. At 99 years old, he, he was still a human being, even though this patriarch of faith. At 99 and waiting all this time, surely he thought, maybe I messed up when I did this. Maybe I met the lost it when I did that. You know, God hasn't done this. And I'm almost 100 years old. You heard him questioning God. So he had to be a little discouraged and start to think, wow, maybe I missed it. So God wrote, no, 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 you haven't missed it. The promise is still in the future. Stop and think about the promises that we have. Anybody think of a promise that you have as a follower of Christ? Anything that would help remember? Eternal life, right? He says that if you will believe in me, even after dying, you will what? You will live. And the scriptures are complete by telling us that we will have a body just like whose? Jesus Christ. So we have something to look forward to. After we die, we will live. We will live in a glorified body and we have something else. An inheritance laid up that moths and rust cannot get to. We have promises. And so during the mundane times, during the times we think, well, God's just not using me. Maybe God's finished with me. Maybe where I messed up back here, He's done with me. No, no, no. We've got to remember our promises are yet to come. They're in the future. right? They're ahead of us and they can't be taken away. And the same is true. This, this was an eternal covenant with Abraham. It couldn't be taken away. right? So he gets reminded, all right, here, here are the basics. Be faithful, be blameless, and yes, I am going to multiply your seed, even though you're 99 years old. All right, so now, let's talk about something we, else we don't like. We don't like to wait. We also don't like changes. Okay, We don't like changes. Back to my baseball illustration. You're sitting on the bench. You've been there a while. Coach shakes the cobwebs out like he did Abram, or Abraham now. And he tells him, get ready to go. And he says, you're going into third base. All right, awesome. I've never played third base. I've always played center field. In high school, I played center field. In college, I played center field. In the minors, I played center field. I am well past the training days to, to reclass me somewhere else. And you want me to play third? Yes, absolutely. I sure do. All right. Okay, that's the picture I thought of when we start to hear some things that Abram hears. First, he hears about circumcision. That's huge. We're going to talk about that next. We'll leave that alone. What else does he hear? What changes were made? Nay, Nay for 99 years, he had answered to Abram. And now he gets a name change. Right? they got to change his uniform. His jersey doesn't work anymore. Now, what, who else has got a name change? Sarah. Sarah. She's almost 90. So for 90 years of her life, she's going by Sarai and... We may not see this as significant as they did. Their names meant something. They just didn't get some random name. Their names had really high value to them. So to get your name changed late in life, that's a huge change. That's a big, big deal. Boy, this is really important because I thought of this myself. The older we get, the less we like change. In our younger days, many of us traveled around the world and did different things and had different vocations. I mean, we literally went to the other side of the planet uh, for a while. And it was exciting when you're young, right? It's new things, new places, new, new people. We're really full of energy and then we start to slow down. 
A little bit later in life, we're often drawn where? Home. Wherever we started. There's a big draw to go back home, to be back there for parents to, or whomever in their twilight years. And we go and we do what? We settle. We go and we dig in. We buy that house that we're going to live in the rest of our life. And we may even get to the point it's paid off and we're never going to move. This is our place. Our family's here. Our friends are here. We love our church. <laughs> right? I've heard that. Thankfully. Uh, we love where we are. And then God comes along and shakes out the cobwebs and says, it's time for a change. Does he do that late in life? Absolutely. All right? Absolutely he does do that late in life. He makes changes. And so we've got to be ready for that. Abram was. He was ready for a name change. He was ready for his wife's name change. We need to be ready as well. For God to use us, sometimes He has to make some pretty dramatic changes. Someone once said, you need to keep your tug on your tent pegs every now and then to make sure they're loose enough for God to pull up. Because sometimes as we get older, we dig in and we are resistant to change. And a lot of times in order for God to do something big in our life, there's got to be something dramatic happening. And it requires change. And so the two things we like or don't like. We don't like waiting. We don't like change. We've knocked those out. We've got to learn to wait. We've got to learn to handle change. <laughs> We've got to learn to handle challenges too. Alright? we got to learn to handle challenges. Uh, consider what Abraham was just told to do. Alright? Um, now there are health reasons why we circumcise our baby boys today. At least some proponents of that. And we're not Jews, so we we don't do it, but we, we do it early enough that they're not traumatized by it. They don't remember it. They, they don't know anything different. Hmm. Abraham's told to go out to a group of adult men and tell them this is what has to happen. What do you think their response is? God told you what? Are you sure? You want to go back and talk to him again? I, I think you need to Get some confirmation. Because I'm not up for this. Right? They had never heard of anything like this. This was this had to be way off the wall. And, and Abram had to explain to them, I'm sure in depth and detail, why. Why in the world would we do this? And so he talks about the covenant. Talk. I, they, they haven't seen any of these things. Abram, you're 99 and you haven't had kids with Sarah yet. That part of the promise hasn't happened. We don't own this land. That part of the promise hasn't happened. Abram, you've been telling us all these things, and now if we do this, you say that's going to be a covenant, so they happen. You talk about a challenge that God has put in front of this man. So you've got to stop and think Abram had to have two things. First, he had to have credibility, didn't he? When he said, the Lord said, they had to be able to trust him. By, and how would they trust him? By those last 13 years. Yes, it was quiet. Yes, it was mundane. But they had to watch him going day by day as he was faithful. Day by day as he was blameless. Day by day they knew he was drawing from a deep well. And so when he comes in with this huge challenge for them, they had to believe he really did hear from God. He had to have credibility. And then... This is huge. Abram led by example. I hope you were following the order of events. Who went first? The 99-year-old man. Right? The 99-year-old man went first. And then he... And then again, Ishmael was also... He was circumcised into God's people as well. That's an interesting thing to go do some research about sometime. Verse 26 says, Abram and his son Ishmael uh, were circumcised. And then 27 says, the rest were circumcised with him. Right? In two important words. With him. That's how he was able to meet this challenge that he was led to do. Because he did it with them. That's critical. When it comes to meeting challenges set before us by God, we had better not expect anything of someone else that we're not willing to do ourselves. All right? We better lead from the front. I was just talking today about the difference between preaching and pastoring. There's a big difference. 
Preaching is just proclaiming the word. It's an act that we do. It's a gift that's given. Pastoring is something else. It's shepherding. Okay? It's the whole gambit which includes preaching and teaching and counseling and the whole nine yards. And how does a shepherd lead? From the front. He pulls. He doesn't push. And that's our example. How did Jesus lead? I am the good one. Shepherd. He led by example. He got away and prayed to the Father. He, he, he went to the temple. He went through the, the spiritual rituals that he was supposed to go through. He led from the front. That's important. Now, this, again, what do we get into? Uh, circumcision itself obviously didn't save them. We have to make that statement. Because if it did, all the women were lost. There's your answer, right? It was, it was a practice. What did he say? It was a mark. It was a mark, and they didn't go around showing people their mark. It was a mark that they knew they had. It was a mark that they knew they were part of God's people. It was an act of obedience. And so, again, we're going to talk more about it Sunday uh, when we get, because it, it comes up in the New Testament as well. But this circumcision was simply an identifying mark. We have one too, right? The Bible tells us, Paul says, uh, that we have a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of our sinful nature right like the literal circumcision it's not a visible mark it's not something we can literally show somebody instead they see it in the way that we live that's what was expected of god's people the circumcised the world should have seen it by the way they lived and as we keep studying we'll learn it didn't always happen that way so don't get bogged down in the act of circumcision uh, if you do you're going to miss the intent of this passage abram was faithful during the mundane years. So he was ready when God shook the cobwebs out and gave him some changes to make in his life and gave him a tremendous challenge. And then finish this out in the right way. When he got that challenge, all right, I, I was obeyed uh, quickly. It said that day. When God told him this, he, he, didn't think, he, he didn't say, how am I going to explain this to them? Or maybe I need to ease them into this. Or maybe I need to spend some additional time in prayer, right? Maybe I need to really make sure. No, he was confident this was from the Lord. And it says he immediately went and did it, right? He obeyed quickly and completely. So even after 13 years of mundane silence, he was still ready. when God called him to his next stage. The question is, are we? So you stop and think about it. What are we doing when life is routine? Are we leaving our spiritual life in neutral uh, until the next crisis comes? Do we set God up on a shelf like a lucky rabbit's foot? And then when troubles come, we go find Him and reach and rub it off and say, Help me, God. That's not a deep relationship. Stop and think I did some math this week again just for myself. Uh, and I thought it was telling. We are busy about many things. Uh, too many things. Our lives are full and overflowing with activity, but very little of it has anything to do with the relationship with God. So do the math. How many hours are in a day? Easy question. 24. How many days are in a week? Seven. How many hours a week is that? Not so easy, maybe a little more challenging. Do the math, 168, okay? 168. So it's 168 hours in a given week. Let's assume we get eight hours of sleep. I know you'll laugh. Because right, some of you live off of three or four. Let's assume you sleep for eight hours. That leaves 112 waking hours a week. Let's assume we spend 60 hours getting ready for work, going to work, working, and coming home from work. Okay? Let's assume we spend 60 hours. That's probably an average work week today. That leaves us with 52 hours of waking time a week. 52 hours. Now, how many of those hours do we spend in our relationship with God? That was a challenge for me, and I thought I'd share with you. We give Him an hour on Sunday, big deal. Another hour on Wednesday, a little bigger deal. What are we giving Him daily? What are we doing in our routines to make sure life doesn't get mundane? To make sure our, our relationship with Him is not shallow? To make sure we are ready when God calls to answer that call. To me, that's our challenge as we look again at the life of Abraham. He was in it for the long haul. We need to be as well.
Okay. Our closing song is page number? 227. 227. Won't you stand with us, please? So we sing 227. 